Welcome to the Lindsay Year Symposium. This is a symposium in which we're exploring the innovations and changes that were made during the years that John Lindsay was mayor of the city of New York from 1966 to 1973. And the challenges and efforts that he undertook in order to make New York a livable city in a time that was quite tumultuous in the New York and the national history. I want to welcome you to this program and to join the program that's in progress. This is interesting because we've talked a lot about how important people were during this whole process of creating change and the importance of having both people work together but also getting the kind of creative talent to think outside the box and be willing to take on some of the challenges. So this panel really focuses about many of the things that went on during this period to attract the best and the brightest and energetic and committed to New York City. Delighted that Stan Litow, who um, was part of the story, uh, has agreed to kind of shepherd the panel. And so Steve, Stan will open the panel up and introduce our panelists. Um, Stan is currently IBM's Vice President of Corporate Citizenship and Corporate Affairs uh, and President of IBM's Foundation. He was involved as, I think, the Assistant Chancellor of the Board of Ed. Close. Close. Deputy Chancellor of the, while well, it was still part of the Board of Ed. Um, he was, at one stage, the director of the city's office, or the, the city's urban core, and was, is still very actively involved in creating programs, both locally and nationally, and in corporate America, not just in the public, of getting people to volunteer to do service. So it's my great pleasure to in, introduce Stan Litow. Thank you very much. And, uh, I am joined on this panel discussion by Sig Ginsburg. Uh, you can read Sig's uh, bio, but for this conversation and discussion, uh, the most significant and important thing is that he was the leader, shepherd, and over the last, I don't know how many years, the godfather of the Urban Fellows Program, a very uh, instrumental effort in recruiting a lot of very smart, uh, motivated, and talented people into New York City government and governments uh, around the United States and internationally and a whole host of other significant and important things. And in a moment, I will introduce uh, Sig to talk briefly. And Eileen Leff, uh, again, you can uh, read Eileen's bio, but she was uh, very influential and very active in a variety of different consulting and management improvement uh, projects in the city, and I think has some strong views about uh, the degree to which uh, the mayor and the Lindsay administration r recruited uh, smart, energetic, and inv involved people into government. A lot of them are still involved, people who are sitting in the audience. And then Deborah Sale, uh, who I worked with uh, in the mayor's office, uh, she ran a high school volunteer program. That was not something that a lot of mayors thought was worth their time and effort. Uh, certainly not something that a lot of people who are involved in machine politics worried about. Uh, and Deborah's had a very, very long career in government at a variety of different levels, federal, state, and um, People are going to talk for about you know, five or ten minutes, and then I'm going to start the questions and answers, and then we're going to open it up for people from the audience. But I thought I would begin this discussion a little bit about you know, why a lot of us, I think, in the room think that the Lindsay administration was somewhat unique or different or special. And I think part of it had to do with the fact that in New York City and in a variety of other uh, cities around the US, um, the way that people got into government were two ways. One, through taking civil service examinations, and another way was by going through political clubhouses. And there really were not a lot of alternate means of attracting people into government who had different set of training, different set of motivations, different set of experiences, creativity, and energy. And uh, some of us think that part of the reason why there were so many innovations that took place over that eight-year period. Uh, wasn't only because of the issues or the problems, it was because of the people. So this panel will uh, focus its attention really on John Lindsay as a motivating force for encouraging uh, people into government who might not have gotten there. You know, there are people who began their career very often in the Lindsay administration and then had very, very long careers in a variety of different public, private, not-for-profit, educational experiences. And I think part of it 
had to do with the kinds of people that got attracted into government. So that's the focal point of this. It's about talent, it's about excitement and getting people involved in public service and giving them an opportunity to contribute. So I'll kick off the discussion with talking a little bit about the urban core. Uh, for those of you in the audience, you recall that right before John Lindsay got elected, uh, we went through the Kennedy administration on a federal level. Uh, next month is the 50th anniversary of the Peace Corps. Uh, President Kennedy gave a speech at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Uh, he was very late to it. It happened in the middle of the morning. Uh, thousands of college students were there. He laid out the idea of a Peace Corps, and the next morning, thousands of students had signed signatures before there were electronic signatures saying they wanted to sign up to make a difference in public service, the Peace Corps. And when John Lindsay got elected mayor, he looked for a construct that would capture that interest and excitement of getting people involved in public service, and he coined the uh, idea of an urban core. And, uh, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about the Lindsay administration and how uh, dollars were committed to a variety of activities, but he came up with, I think, a fairly ingenious way to get large numbers of young people involved in an urban core, and that was to access a piece of federal legislation, a federal college work study program, which was a very large source of dollars, and up until that point, uh, young people worked on campus, in jobs on campus, and 80% of their salary was paid by the federal government, and Lindsay went to the university community and said, uh, give us the 80%, give us the federal money under college work study, the city will pay 20 cents on the dollar, and those people will be involved in community service and public service. And at its peak, about 10,000 students were involved in the urban core in New York City. Other mayors picked up on Lindsay's idea, uh, actively promoted by the Lindsay leaders in the leaders in the city government. Under Tim Costello, who was uh, Lindsay's deputy mayor, very smart guy, a friend of many of us uh, on this uh, uh, panel, and. Many other mayors brought into their administrations urban cores to the point where there were about 40 or 50 other mayors that ran urban cores, some of them fairly significant and large in cities like Atlanta, Cincinnati, Minneapolis, around uh, the US, using the Lindsay model of urban core. Why was that important? It was be be important because contracts were signed with about 100 or more colleges and universities, many of them in the city, but all around the country, and young people could come in and they could people the government of New York City. Every single department had Urban Corps interns. They were law students, they were business students, they were public policy students, they were people interested in education and public policy. And many of those people have found their way into government over the decades, made significant contributions and it's interesting because now we're at the 50th anniversary of the Peace Corps, and a lot of people are discussing new models to bring people into government. In Harris Wofford, many of you know Harris was uh, an aide to President Kennedy uh, and uh, worked very hard on uh, service efforts, was the head of the Corporation for National Service under Carter. He wrote a book, and he signaled out the Lindsay years and the Urban Corps as being perhaps the most effective model for getting large numbers of young people involved in service. So the name has changed. They call it a public service corps now, but the urban corps still exists. That was an important effort, but it probably couldn't have happened unless a mayor thought that public service, community service, getting young people involved in government was an important and good thing. So I will uh, close and now introduce Sig Ginsburg, and Sig will talk about the Urban Fellows Program and why did that survive? Sig, go for it. Um, I joined the Office of the Mayor, um, Office of Administration, headed by Tim Costello, worked with Stan, worked with Steve. I joined it in 1966 as Special Assistant to the Deputy Mayor and, um, and also as a Senior Management Analyst. And a year later, I was promoted to Assistant uh, City Administrator, leading a group of management analysts. I formed a separate from my regular job, I, I started a summer intern program. We didn't pay any money to the interns, um, just two of them uh, at summer of 67 and the summer of 68. 
And then in September 68, I just sat down and wrote a proposal for the New York City Urban Fellowship Program. Um, in the, and when I was in graduate school the, uh, for, in public administration, uh, the places, there were three places that you would think about going to, to work. The Office of Secretary of Defense, the Federal Bureau of the Budget, or the Port Authority of New York. My dream was to create something that would have, be a place, one of the big four now, rather than one of just the big three. My idea was to have a nationwide competition for 20 outstanding individuals, open to those who were in their senior year of college or in graduate school. They would spend an academic year in city government um, on very selected assignments with selected mentors or supervisors. There would be seminars, off the record seminars with uh, the mayor, with um, assistants to the mayor, commissioners, et cetera, and anyone else that the urban fellows might want to have speak. And by the way, in the years that I uh, directed it, the first three years and I was involved in the selection of the fourth class, no one I invited, I would just call and say, this is Sid Ginsburg from Mayor Lindsay's office, uh, no one ever turned down an invitation to speak to the Urban Fellows. Uh, we gave them a, a sandwich, a corned beef sandwich and a beer. And all of this came about um, because of the charisma, if you will, of John Lindsay and the very active support and involvement of Tim Costello, whose profession had been as an NYU professor. But in any event, the, so the idea was to attract, and I said it boldly and boldly, the best and the brightest in the country. Uh, and, and I meant it. Uh, and so th what I, my plan was that they would get academic credit from their universities, that they would get money from their universities. Now, anyone who's dealt with uh, academic institutions knows that to get an institution to give money and academic credit um, is something of a battle. Um, my, and the plan was to make it part of the office of the mayor for clout. I wanted it to have major impact and the mayor supported it all the way and had seminars with the fellows and all of that. I hope that the experience, the dream was, the hope was that the experience would get the fellows to want to spend the summer after their fellowship in city government and when they completed their graduate degrees or education, that they would think of the city as a place to go uh, or spend at some point, some time in city government or if not New York City, remember urban in the title, New York City Urban Fellows. Um, I was concerned about the urban situation and that's why I, I set it up that way with academic credit and, and being part of the academic enterprise, so to speak, uh, because I wanted colleges and universities to focus on the urban condition and, and urban courses and, and uh, internships. The whole idea was Sloan Foundation pick it up for two years, city government would pick it up the third year. Sloan Foundation gave us $180,000. Uh, the fellows were paid $3,500 a year for the first, two, the first two fellow groups, and the third year we got them up to $4,000. Um, so that was the outline of the plan. It was announced January 1 uh, of 69. Um, the um, announcement at City Hall, the uh, president of the foundation and the mayor, uh, there was a great deal of hoopla and enthusiasm. This was John Lindsay, was, and to give you some idea, uh, in the first year, remember, college, you, oh, and, and it's changed since, and I'll tell you about that in a moment, but um, you were nominated by your college or university. So you had to be nominated by your college or university. They were giving you credit, 500 bucks. Um, and we had, uh, uh, for the first class, we had 103 applicants from 67 institutions. Well, this caught on, word of mouth, et cetera, et cetera. By the time I left, I was involved in the recruitment of the fourth class. Uh, and by that time, uh, there was um, uh, uh, 150, there were 257 nominations from 137 institutions. In other words, 157% increase in applicants and an over 100% increase in the number of colleges and universities. 
who uh, were involved. Um, and part of the first year, my problem with getting positions, because what we did is we developed like 40 positions that were worthy of a fellow's attention. Um, I had to convince commissioners to entrust for real responsibility to some people who were 20 years old. Uh, this took some selling, but by the end of the first year, it became a prestige item. Did you have a fellow? So by the second year, instead of offering 40 positions for the 20 fellows, we had 50 positions possible, then 60 positions. So it grew, and it was very exciting. Uh, by the way, the changes uh, that obviously things change, and so now it is about 25 fellows, uh, it's no longer their students. They have to be college graduates no more than two years out of school. Um, and they have many of the things in the seminars, the same things that, that we had. But there have been improvements because some of the stuff they do is work as a, as a group of fellows, not individuals that they do fellowship projects. They get paid $30,000 a year now. Um, in any event, to give you some sense of, of what happened to the pioneers, um, the ones who sat around my room so I know more about them. Uh, they range from someone who is currently the CFO of Bellevue Hospital, um, someone who was, Con and you may know this name, Con Howe was um, the executive director of the City Planning Commission uh, here in New York and later went on to serve uh, 12 years as director of, of planning for Los Angeles. Um, a name I'm sure some of you know, Leon Botstein, the long-serving president of Bard uh, and director of the American Symphony Orchestra and guest director of various orchestras. Uh, he was assistant to the president of the Board of Education as an urban fellow. Another urban fellow of the Pioneer Group uh, was um, assistant to the police commissioner. Remember, the jobs that I had selected were mainly assistants, too. Currently, there are many more positions in the field. Uh, but there is a, Larry Sherman has a chaired professorship at the University of Pennsylvania and also at Cambridge University. He's probably the leading criminologist, uh, professor of criminology in the United States, if not the world. And he, was, and he owes it, as he has told us. Um, but anyway, this gives you some sense of the kinds of people we were able to attract. Uh, one woman, Diana Daniels, is vice president and general counsel and secretary of the board of the Washington Post uh, today. Um, and there are others, but I'll, I'll save time uh, by uh, not uh, going. Uh, also, one uh, guy, Dan Feldman, has served in the state served in the state legislature for 17 years, is now a professor at John Jay, but uh, served as special counsel to the New York State uh, Comptroller. Um, the um, other thing I, I wanted to, uh, to note is uh, that in the current administration, um, the, uh, and in the history of the fellows, the highest ranking city official is Deputy Mayor uh, Linda Gibbs. She started in the 80s as a graduate of the program. We have two commissioners, uh, the commissioner of the New York City Department of Small Business uh, and the commissioner uh, of the Department of Youth and Community Development and other uh, people at high rank currently in the city government. So um, I guess all I can say is um, that I've done lots of things since um, including being the senior vice president um, at the American Museum of Natural History and project executive for building the Rose Center for Earth and Space. But I have to tell you the thing I am proudest of is the New York City Urban Fellowship Program. Sig, thank you. I think it's sort of interesting that innovations that Lindsay brought into government have lasted so long and have been uh, modeled so often in other cities states and on the federal level. So now Eileen. Yeah. Uh, I worked as a research consultant for Carter Bales at McKinsey and we were privileged enough to work with Fred Hayes at the Bureau of the Budget and with the mayor's office on many projects. And out of that and out of the program we've seen this morning, I'd like to say that John Lindsay's legacy is the people 
who worked with him, and what they did not only in his administration, but with the rest of their lives in serving the city, the country, and the world. He did establish a model for young people to come into government <coughs> service. At that time, many of us had grown up inspired by John F. Kennedy's New Frontier. Most of us were too young to work then, but we found that that spirit was reborn in the Lindsay administration. So we were inspired by John Lindsay's values-based leadership with people talk about now. He really did exemplify and his vision and his empowerment of people of People of all kinds of backgrounds uh, were hired. Look, he launched this campaign for the best and the brightest talent, and he was not uh, uh, limited as to the kinds of people he hired. If they had the skills that we heard about this morning, the analytic skills, the project management skills, computer skills, other kinds of skills that were just being developed at that time, you could come through the door. It didn't matter whether you were black, white, male, female, Hispanic, whatever your background was, if you had these skills and the enthusiasm, you were welcome. Uh, it's been written and said that uh, this was a group of limousine liberals. I have to say, we were lucky if we could afford the subway <laughs> because we had just graduated, most of us, from leading universities that not so long before would never have let us in the door because of the quotas that they had for ethnic groups and different uh, demographic groups. So we were the children of the working class and the middle class and uh, not riding in limousines. And I have to say that uh, we heard a lot about Mike Quill as a leader in the city. Well, there was another guy of Irish background, Frederick O'Reilly Hayes, and we heard about him uh, this morning in terms of his inspiration. Uh, I think there are some qualities that he had. We heard about his brilliance uh, compared to Einstein, his leadership skills of the Pied Piper, and he also had a great wit and sense of humor uh, that made it fun to work with him. He also had the capacity to trust people and to empower them and to inspire them to do new things to uh, build teams and do things differently. And in 1971, New York Magazine called him the star of the Lindsay administration. And he was not only a star because of the management innovations, but because of his inspiration and leadership of people. Uh, we heard a lot about the management innovations on program planning and budgeting this morning. There are some others that I honestly, in going through all these programs, haven't heard and would like to put out there that we accomplished. Uh, we did raise revenues in regard to taxing. We taxed environmental diseconomies that made the air cleaner for the city as well as people all over the world because we taxed the lead in gasoline. So that if you wanted to buy leaded gasoline, people might not remember that there actually was lead in gasoline that po polluted the skies no matter where you were. So we taxed the lead in gasoline, making unleaded gasoline more advantageous economically and encouraging companies then to produce more unleaded gas. We also put a tax on the tar and nicotine level of cigarettes, and we offered the first recycling incentive tax ever in the country or the world uh, that was implemented briefly until the Packaging Institute lobbied against it, which was some of the lessons that we learned. We also worked to structure the Health and Hospitals Corporation and we designed the rent stabilization law that was meant to continue the opportunity for middle class people to live in the city. And we met to develop plans in order to retain a, a residential neighborhood in the city. 
We worked on the charter in terms of service districts for people that would get government closer to people. We opened opportunities to house the homeless and to plan new areas of the city. So there were many management innovations that hadn't come to light, I think, uh, in our program yet. And at the time, magazines were writing about the greening of America. The young people who were described as hippies or draft dodgers, and they pointed out that there was this group of young people who were working within the system to make change for the good of all. And I think that's who we were, that's who we are, that's who we continue to be. Uh, John Lindsay and his values-based leadership and Fred Hayes with his emphasis on management excellence inspired a generation of people who went on to do lead institutions and organizations throughout the city and the world. The, it was mentioned uh, the International Herald Tribune, the Rockefeller Foundation, UNICEF, Lincoln Center, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Citibank, the CIT, many companies. Uh, they served in Congress. They've made laws for all. They've headed and educational institutions. So we are the executives, the lawyers, the writers, the social entrepreneurs, the business entrepreneurs, the advisors, investors, community leaders, making real change for the better, not only then, but now. And I have to close with a remark that Lou Feldstein said at the end of the PBS uh, documentary, and I don't know if uh, anybody can communicate or if we've communicated this to young people that there was a surge of electricity, a cable running through history that does not happen often in your life, and we grabbed it. And I hope we give you a sense of what it was like. Thank you, Eileen. <laughs> Great. Deborah? Uh, I came re quite late to the Lindsay administration. Um, I uh, was a uh, child of the 60s. I uh, grew up in the South. I went to school in the South. I moved to Washington. I met Ronnie Eldridge, and uh, Ronnie uh, recruited me into the Lindsay administration um, and sent me over to see Betsy Gottbaum, who was at that point the mayor's assistant for education. And the Board of Education had just promulgated something called Special Circular 90. And Special Circular 90 allowed high school students to receive credit for doing out-of-school work. And this was revolutionary. It had never happened before in New York. I'm not sure it had happened anywhere else in the country. Um, and we decided that we would start up, the mayor's office decided, and, and Stan was very much a part of this. I actually reported to Stan. And Stan and I, Stan and I worked uh, in uh, the deputy mayor's office, Ed Morrison's office. And I think Ed Morrison's office sort of got all the catches catch can kind of programs, you know. Um, whatever is new and innovative and no one knows quite what to do with, it, that, that's where it belonged. So um, the Urban Corps was a great model, obviously, uh, because uh, there were college students who were in internships across city government. Um, Special Circular 90 allowed credit not only for uh, government work, for, but for nonprofit work as well. And so we set about creating internship possibilities for high school students uh, across the city of New York. And we worked with schools to set up these programs. Um, some of them, uh, the schools chose to set up a program for seniors who were just about to graduate, who had really completed most of their credits, and who were basically trying out careers to see whether they would be interested in, in city government or the nonprofit world. Um, and some of them uh, were schools like JFK in the Bronx, where they had a cadre of stu students who were just frankly not coming to school at all, and they hoped that if they could create an internship program and engage these children in an in in internship program, that they would have some sense of the world of work and that they might decide that, there were, that school was valuable after all. Um, and so it, ra it really ran the whole gamut of, of, uh, of possibilities for students. This was in the final year of the Lindsay administration. So even at the end of the Lindsay administration, 
there was an interest, a willingness to start up new programs. There was, uh, you know, often people say, oh, well, it's the end of the term and everyone is sort of a malaise and no one's interested in doing anything new. That wasn't true in the Lindsay administration. There still was a, an energy, a willingness, um, uh, a, a, a desire to start things that would be new and that might last beyond our tenure. Um, and in fact, I lasted beyond our tenure much longer than I expected because uh, I, I was asked to stay in place and work for Mayor Beam when he came in, which was sort of a shock, but, uh, but we did that. <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, and we continued that program. Um, in the first year, we had uh, a few over 250 interns uh, across the city of New York. It's obviously, job descriptions were critically important, as you said. Uh, mentorship and, uh, and supervision was very important. Uh, any of you who have ever dealt with interns, or, or certainly with volunteers, we, you know, this was not a pet group that got pay at all. Uh, they got credit, although you know, if they probably dropped out and went back to school, it's, they wouldn't necessarily, uh, it wouldn't be the end of their life. Uh, so they had to be well supervised and engaged, or there wouldn't be uh, a, a, a really valid internship. Um, and volunteers really have to have the same level of supervision, if not greater supervision, uh, than those who are in the workforce. And certainly, teenagers uh, need mentorship and, uh, and supervision. Um, so we, uh, we had over 250 students in that first year. In the summer, uh, because we had a strong system in place, we were asked then to run a uh, model neighborhood youth corps program. And you know the neighborhood youth corp has had various uh, uh, ups and downs throughout its lifetime. Um, but our feeling was that if we had a strong system of supervision, uh, then that that program could work better and could be more successful as well. And uh, and it and it was. Um, and we had students at the Museum of Natural History. Um, we had uh, actually a student who had hardly gone to school at all, who worked in the model building uh, part of the Museum of Natural History, who became, he was an artist, frankly, and he became so engaged and so excited. And he really, it turned his life around. Um, it, it's because these were high school students and, uh, and it's been a long time now, um, you know, I, I, I don't have the same uh, sense necessarily of where they've all ended up. Um, but I do run into them periodically. Um, I ran into a cameraman at ABC, I live on the Upper West Side, uh, walking down the sidewalk the other day, and he said, I'd never be here. My life was turned around by being in the high school volunteer program, by being in that internship program. And we were really, we were participating in the education system. We were bringing young people into connection with their communities, with nonprofits, and with government. Um, and frankly, now, it's, at that time, maybe, I mean, people were, young people occasionally were candy stripers or something of that sort. I mean, when you thought about volunteerism, maybe you thought about teenage candy stripers in hospitals. But you really didn't have any sense of, of service uh, or a, uh, a, a sense that service was a necessary component of growing up and becoming an adult, uh, I think, prior to that time. And now it is almost, it's cl completely routine. Mm -hmm. uh, virtually every high school student is expected to do some level of community service. Uh, but that was really the beginning of that movement. Um, so, you know, things like uh, the National Service Corps and other, thing, other, or other uh, movements have really grown out of those early fledgling efforts. Um, and I, I was reminded uh, when you, both of you said the people were really what were exceptional in the Lindsay administration. Um, the most uh, breathtaking moment, I think, at John Lindsay's funeral was when Charlie Wrangell stood up and asked everyone whom John Lindsay had brought into government in that huge cathedral of St. John the Divine to stand. And fully two-thirds of the people in the cathedral stood. And that's really the basis of our society today. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, before I open it up for, for questions, I wanted a, one observation. Uh, uh, as I said earlier, it's the 50th anniversary of the Peace Corps uh, in October uh, when it was announced and then in, uh, after Kennedy took office in, uh, 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 in his first year. But in the eight years that John Lindsay was mayor, 
there were more Urban Corps interns over that eight-year period than have served in the Peace Corps in 50 years. Sort of an interesting uh, footnote. Uh, uh, and uh, I wanted to ask the people on the panel uh, you know, uh, two questions. One, to what extent uh, was, do you think there was an interest in young people, whether on full-time jobs or urban core interns or urban fellows or high school students, what role did Lindsay, as the symbol of running the city, play in helping to recruit people? And, and the second uh, observation I'd like is, uh, to what extent do you think it uh, resulted in some of the innovations that have been talked about? Uh, were the people who came in, uh, did they have a different idea about public service as opposed to perpetuating what was in existence, but actually trying to do new things or start new things, and how much of that had to do with the mayor. So, Sig, do you want to start, or and then anybody else join in? I I think in terms of the urban fellows, it was um, really the same thing that motivated me. Um, I wanted to be part of. I wanted to be part of this man's administration. Um, and I think once it was announced, once he was the public face, um, people, it, he was charismatic. And I think whether you were a, a senior in college or in your, we had kids take leave of absence or work out something with their law school or, or their PhD program or whatever, they wanted to be part of it. Uh, because um, working in New York under Lindsay would be exciting and challenging. And, and I, did he play a, could another mayor have done it? Maybe, I don't know, but I know one thing for sure. He was John Lindsay and people wanted to be there. Right. Eileen? Well, I think that uh, he was char charismatic and he was open to new ideas. His administration had a purpose of reform, of social change, and uh, he accepted anyone at the table who had good ideas and made them happen. And so, uh, as I said, he was open to people of all sorts as long as you had a good idea. Deborah. I think he also, he seemed very young. Mm -hmm. uh, so he was very young uh, in spirit, uh, very much a young leader, and he drew young people to him. And it was the time, too. I mean, we were children of the 60s, and uh, so we were people who wanted to be engaged, mm -hmm. and he was very engaging. And, it, and New York seemed to be the place to be if you wanted to be in an activist governmental world. Um, so that, I think, really had a lot to do with it as well. Uh, in terms of the other question, um, you know, I, I thought about this when we started to, to uh, think about this panel, and for the most part, prior to that, we talked about political placements in government prior to that, but um, people had seen government after the Depression as a good, solid uh, jobs where they could stay for a lifetime. And they took the service, civil service exam, and they basically came into government because they wanted a good, solid place to stay for a lifetime. Um, that was not the impetus of most of the, of the leadership in the Lindsay administration. Um, and that was revolutionary, I think. Uh, and I, you know, I still think, I think even the civil service became sh shaken up and different um, because leadership does really matter. Uh, but I think that, that the impulse to go into government had really was different for us than it had been for those who preceded us. I, I was 29 when I came in the government, and compared to some of the assistants to the mayor, I felt like the older brother. Yes. <laughs> As a matter of fact, uh, in, uh, in an era before email, uh, when uh, young people wrote letters, Lindsay got about 1,000 letters a week from young people that basically said, I want to come to New York City, and I want to work in city government, I want to work for you. So I, I think the answer is that, you know, uh, a, a, an attractive, reform-oriented, and very different administration did provide a beacon that invited a lot of people in, and the administration had a lot of ways that people could get in. It wasn't just clubhouses, and it wasn't just civil service exams, but 
the people who worked in the administration, commissioners, assistant commissioners, mayoral assistants, et cetera, had, their, had the welcome mat out for people who had uh, an interest, and there were vehicles for people to be involved. So that was one of the ways that uh, a lot of talented people came in. Not everybody was uh, a star, but there were a lot of innovations that wound up happening. In the mayor's office, there was a mayor's office for the aged. There was never a mm -hmm. department for the aged in any other city. Uh, whether it was a mayor's office of volunteers or environmental uh, protection, a lot of those ideas, consumer affairs, were first of a kind mm -hmm. during that period of time. So now we've got about 15 minutes left, and you've heard a little bit about urban core, urban fellows, recruiting people into government, high school students, and the role that Lindsay played. We've got a lot of people in the audience who have a lot to say and know a lot about bringing talent into government and have done it and have participated in it. So now let's open it up for questions from the audience. Just say who you are and then address your question to the entire panel or anybody that you'd like. The floor is open. While we're waiting, I just want to say one thing about the role of women in the Lindsay administration. When you go to the museum, you'll see pictures of women marching down Fifth Avenue in August of 1970 demanding equal rights. At that same time, I and other women were meeting with John Lindsay at the table accepting women as equals, which was revolutionary. If you want to know what it was like before, you only have to watch Mad Men, where <laughs> it shows that there, all the decisions were being made by white men. John Lindsay was not like that. He appointed women, Ronnie Eldridge, I mean, numerous people, uh, Elizabeth Holzman, Bella Abzug, I, Carol Bellamy, Heather Ruth, many women to decision-making positions, and that was, at that time, also rather revolutionary. Very different. Good. Who's got a question? I see. I'm sorry that our president have lost something like that, because you, that period, I can feel, you know, gave the young people not only hope, but a sense of identity, participation, you know, and that's what children education-wise need here, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, it's Thank interesting. You. I, I, I just um, was reading the Times today about the uh, rally, the Obama rally at the University of, of uh, Wisconsin. And I think during the campaign um, that he really did give young people that kind of hope and excitement. Um, now, the. I mean, it was interesting. I, one of the things I was thinking earlier when Stan was talking about bringing people of all, you know, all sorts and from lots of different places, uh, Lindsay did pay a price for that. I mean, pol uh, politically and uh, in the press, uh, there were all, I mean, you know, people in neighborhood government came from Australia. I mean, there were, you know, there were all these blow-ups periodically. But the, um, the temper of the times was different from the, t the current times. Um, and I think that sustaining that passion is really very difficult now, um, but is critical to the future of the country. I, I think it really is. Yeah. You said Lindsay, which I was well aware of, uh, pushed women along and gave them position, decision-making uh, positions. However, there was still a large hole within the judicial community, the uh, uh, the elective community. What did Lindsay do behind the scenes to encourage women to move forward into elective office? It took a, a long time for women to go for not only city council, but for state office. And uh, of course, it took even a longer time for uh, federal office. Um, behind the scenes, which I don't have privy to, what did Lindsay do to move women forward on those levels? On the elective. Yeah, an well. elective and judicial, it took a long time, but, you know, even like a locally, the district leaders, it took a while before women were, and I was a, I'm a past district leader, to even have such a role. I, I don't know that we are the yeah. experts right. on that, and there may be others who are, but, um, you know, electoral politics in New York has been uh, not the most open territory for women. Uh, for a very, very long time, long before John Lindsay and long after. Um, and Lindsay was not of, a, of the party, and in New, I mean, of, of any party, in fact, in the, toward the end. I mean, he was, um, he was an independent, actually. 
Um, and he, therefore, had, I think, little sway over the internal nominating issues with, re with regard to the, po the party. Now, what he did do is he put a lot of women in positions of power and authority within the administration, which made it possible for people like Liz Holtzman to right. run for office later because they had credentials, governmental mm -hmm. credentials, on which to run. Um, and I don't know at that time if he could have done a lot more than that. I mean, he was, you know, he was gone by the early 70s. And uh, so I don't know what he could have done that would have, I don't know that he could have done a lot more than he did. Now, women in government, starting in the 60s and 70s, women in government have done better than women, women mm -hmm. in terms of managerial positions mm -hmm. and in terms of positions of authority have done better than women in the corporate sector or in other sectors of our society because government has been more open. And he certainly helped uh, New York City government be a lot more open to women. I, I wanted to ask I, the panelists, if I could, a different kind of question away from the uh, political stuff and into the actual operations of city government. In this period of time, there was the civil service. Uh, they were operating in every department and every city agency that you assigned SIG Urban Fellows to or Urban Corps interns worked in or appointees of the mayor ran departments of the government and had to cope with and deal with people who were part of civil service. And there was also still a very active political process, county leaders, Democratic uh, political leaders, even at that point Republican leaders. What were the tensions in bringing young people or innovative people into government who had to operate those departments, uh, put in place those ideas, working side by side with uh, people on the political side and civil servants. What, was, that, was, was there a lot of tension or were you aware of it? I, I think uh, working in the Budget Bureau, one of the things that was mentioned that Fred Hayes did was that he worked with two cultures, uh, the young people, new people coming in, and the people who were existing on the staff. And I know that we gained an enormous amount of knowledge from people who had a long history at the Budget Bureau, such as Jim Cavanaugh. We couldn't have done what we did unless we understood what had happened before. And so Fred really encouraged teamwork and uh, building a cohesive group of people who had been there before and people who had come in new. Now, I just want to say one thing about women. Uh, in 1964, which was really the start of the Lindsay administration, there was a federal executive order signed that said women were equal, the civil rights law. So until 1964, with the executive order signed, there was no notion that women really had to be a part of the community. And we did have Elizabeth Holzman and Bella Abzug, who served in Congress shortly uh, after this period. The Lindsay administration, as probably all administrations are able to do, have a greater effect upon the personnel of the city through their power of, of appointment. If someone in an agency decides to identify with the programs and policies of that administration and they find that they're promoted, that sends a message throughout that agency and it perks down, and the, the people who were once of what you call a different culture all of a sudden become part of your culture. And that, I think, is how the Lindsay administration did manage, and other administrations after him too, by the power of appointment, appointing people in those municipal agencies who identify with executing the goals of the administration. And I think that one of the critical issues in government is that you, you have to manage by consensus. You, know, so you really, uh, you don't have a, a, the possibility of sort of dictating 
uh, the end result and marching everyone to the end. Uh, that's just not possible. You really have to develop a esprit de corps. You have to develop a common uh, common goals. You have to de you have to really bring people to feel that that's where they all want to be headed and to work for you to get there. Uh, because without that, you you will just you will not not really succeed in government. And I think that that's what you were speaking mm -hmm. to, and I think that's really, it, it is what happened. That those cultures came together because of good leadership. Mm -hmm. In the instances in which they didn't, it was because the leadership was not strong enough. One, one uh, story that I'll tell is uh, before I got involved in managing the Urban Corps the prior year, uh, they didn't manage to pay the interns when they uh, began work uh, on a, in a timely fashion, and they picketed City Hall. And uh, when I got into uh, the job, I decided that we were going to get kids paid. You needed help from uh, civil servants. You needed help from the department. And we were getting ready to bring all of the payroll forms, all the paper, over to the municipal building so that they could actually cut the checks. We had about a couple of hours left, and it was 4 o'clock, and everybody got up. And I said, where's everybody going? And they said, summer hours. They had their subway tokens, and it was 4 o'clock, summer hours. It was a very air-conditioned building at 250 Broadway, but uh, summer hours was, uh, and we prevailed upon people, and we did get the people paid. But it was difficult to balance the civil servant uh, and the rules of city government with the incentive of uh, somebody like John Lindsay who wanted to make something exciting happen. But if you don't get people paid, actually, it becomes less exciting. Uh, are there any other questions? Yes. Um, two, two questions. One, a variant on um, what was asked previously. I was uh, wondering, with, um, with existing assistant commissioners and lower level managers in city government, when the mayor came in, um, and the civil servants as well, um, what were some approaches that you um, and other senior staff used um, in order to be able to convince um, some of the more entrenched staff or, you know, folks that have been working for government for a number of years that change is, change is a good thing. What were some of the techniques or some of the strategies? And my second question is, what advice do you have for young people entering public service today? Okay. Anybody on the panel? Sig? Well, um, in terms of the Urban Fellows, remember a, a very select group. Congratulations for having been accepted. But uh, <laughs> the... Um, the mentors or the supervisors were very carefully chosen so that they bought into the program and bought into the idea of what, what will you allow a 20 or 22 year old to do that will challenge them. Um, and they w were sort of the blocking backs for the young urban fellows to get their thing done. So that, and, and you wouldn't become a supervisor or a mentor. Um, without having assured me and having assured the fellows during the uh, interview process that you were the kind of guy or gal who would be good to work with. In terms of people going into government uh, now, um, um, I, through the years, am a great believer in government and government as a career or at least as a five or whatever, some year a binge uh, or good time as well as learning time. I think it, it's tough. Um, Civil service systems need to be improved uh, um, because, you know, it's one thing to get the stars, et cetera, but you need good people who may not be stars, but you need the B people, B plus people, A minus people too. Uh, and I think cities throughout the country have to work on their civil service system. Uh, Steve Savis and I wrote an article many years ago uh, called the civil service a meritless system uh, and uh, it was published in the public interest and and every once in a while I look at that article and try to compare it to today and New York still has a way to go I think I think I would yes, say to young people uh, who are interested in government uh, you'll never find a place where you will have more responsibility at a younger age you will never find a place that would be more exciting and it, you will never find a place that would be more meaningful to your life. I wanted to say one last thing before we close, and this uh, has to do with the fact that uh, you know this uh, is the 50th anniversary of the Peace Corps, and uh, it isn't only about sending people outside the U.S. and the developing world. That's a good thing to do. But finding a mechanism to 
harness the energy and talent of young people in getting them involved in government, either through their high schools, through their universities, is really a challenge. And uh, the President said a lot about it. I think he's been challenged by the economic uh, circumstances that we're all in. But I think there are ways to make this thing work and to get large numbers of people involved in government. That's what Lindsay was about, and that's one of the most, most important achievements of that administration, and it's an important lesson as we go forward. So thanks to the members of the panel, and we'll turn it back over to Stan. Stan, thank you. Um, closing remark, one of the important themes, I think, that emerged out of the, today's sessions and our, and our luncheon address was an unusual concern for a legacy in which when the administration was over, and it clearly was going to end at some point, that the change that was instituted had some longevity to it. The development of people, the attempt to try to figure out how to restructure and organize services. Too often in government, we tend to think about everything being tied to the term of the elected official with no concern what happens afterwards. And I think what's emerged here is how much of what was going on was concerned. I mean, they certainly was concerned about the now, but there was also concern about what happened later. Um, as somebody at, at a university that is concerned about educating students, the story I often now tell them is that 30 years from now, you're going to be running our society. And if we don't prepare you, um, we're in trouble. We already are in trouble. But I think um, if we want to have a different society with a different set of <coughs> values, we need to make the investment today. And I think one of the things we don't talk enough about, which I think Stephen Goldsmith has, in fact, raised, having come here, is all of the things that inhibit you from doing the right thing or inhibit you from doing a better job, more efficiently and more, and more responsive. And we need to start focusing on some of the structural impediments that Esther Fuchs talked about at lunch and make those changes if we really expect to move forward in ways that are much more creative and much more dynamic and not the least of which is changing the civil service system, which has some flexibility in how you hire people, as opposed to having, as Steve Savage described, key punch titles that may describe a key punch operator, but certainly doesn't describe at all the kind of talent you're trying to attract to be able to operate uh, data processing. This is the conclusion of this segment of the Lindsay Year Symposium, in which we've been looking at innovations that were introduced into the operation of New York City government from 1966 to 1973. This symposium is being held at Baruch College, and I look forward to seeing you when we return for the next installment of this symposium.